Major, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, the major lecture for today is not my little uh, uh, thing on culture and translation and, and professional education, which has been a very, very interesting subject for me for a long time. So I thought I'd, I'd do it today again. The major talk will be given by Professor Hamuda Sali, a very good friend of mine. I can call him Hamuda. Uh, he is a um, professor, researcher, senior interpreter, Arabic, English, and French. He has more languages than me. Uh, Dr. Sali is the director of the master's program in translation and interpreting at the University of Tunis, El Manar. He's also founder and organizer of the international, the first conference on translation and interpreting new voices on the marketplace. He has many publications in the area of translation and cross-cultural communication, interpreting, and he has taken part in very many conferences worldwide. That's why he's going to talk about travel, because he traveled so much, obviously, right? If I may interject this. He has extensive pro professional experience, and after my little talk, we know what professionalism is, as a conference interpreting, interpreter, translator, language consultant in the areas of law, business, security, documentary, creative writing, diplomacy, administration, cross-cultural matters and communication. Wow, can I only say. He has successfully, successfully serviced thousands of meetings, workshops and conferences as an international interpreter in almost 46 countries and 440 cities and villages. He acted as interpreting consultant, team leader, chief interpreter, coordinating and chairing teams of interpreters for many different organizations and clients. And, and this is sort of uh, uh, in black here in my little script, he has interpreted for high profile world leaders, such as former and current UN secretaries, General Ban Ki-moon and Antonio Guterres, and current Russian president Vladimir Putin, in relay of course, because you don't speak Russian, I guess. Yes. Um, okay. Dr. Sully is also accredited in several international institutions, for instance, the United Nations, World Bank, etc., etc. Anyway, um, he's also uh, serving as uh, on the editorial board of many journals, but I think we know now that he is a very important, very experienced, and very professional person, right? And I will stop my uh, eulogy now and hand over to you, Amuda. Very much, uh, dear Juliana, for this uh, uh, introduction. Uh, and first of all, I would like to say that it is an honor for me to be able or to be introduced by such a distinguished scholar and be able to share this online stage with her and with other distinguished uh, colleagues, uh, scholars, and uh, very professional translators and interpreters, and also uh, uh, very good students. Uh, so I am addressing a group um, a, 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 uh, with a diversity in a way, uh, uh, more experienced, less experienced. So I will try uh, to strike a balance in the messages that I'm going to send out uh, to strike a balance between um, the, 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 uh, the audiences, I would say. Uh, at the outset, I should make a confession. Uh, I fell in, uh, into a rabbit hole uh, and prepared stuff for uh, two or three lectures instead of one. So I'm going to speed uh, up a little bit through the items uh, that I have prepared and, 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 and I will summarize uh, some of the others and perhaps we'll leave some other items and questions to the discussion. Uh, and maybe I will be writing them in a paper and the ideas might seem then uh, more coherent when you, you, you read the paper. Uh, these encounters were designed to have fresh insights into the translational and interpreting exercises uh, through the prism of practicing translators and interpreters when they uh, share their stories, uh, mm -hmm. their, their uh, professional life 
which I'm going to do also today, because I have so many, uh, as uh, Juliana has uh, kindly introduced me, I have four backgrounds, a common factor among them is translation. I am a translation researcher, a translation uh, professor, uh, practicing translator and practicing interpreter, conference interpreter. So I'm, perhaps I'm going to use these four backgrounds together. Uh, and and um, of course, the other uh, encounters are uh, having that fresh insights through the lenses of experts or researchers in translation or through the lenses of experts uh, uh, from neighboring disciplines such as philosophy, art, literature, and, and, and uh, when they present their approaches to, to translation. So in this talk, I'm going to comment and here I insist on the word comment, on the conceptual interrelationships or interrelationship of travel and interpreting through both perspectives, as I said earlier, sharing my story as a practicing mm -hmm. interpreter and sharing also my modest and humble views as a translation researcher. And of course, uh, I don't uh, claim to be uh, setting out models like Professor uh, uh, House uh, did. Uh, so uh, I'm just investigating uh, very narrow windows uh, in, in translation. I'm going to share now my screen and then to stop sharing it. Um, shop, uh, because I have something to show you before I uh, start the presentation. Can okay. you see my, my screen? Oh yes, but I, I see all the uh, all the all the participants on the right hand side. Does it matter? No. Yeah, no, no problem. It doesn't matter. No problem. Okay. Can you see it now? Okay. Yeah, yeah, very good. By yes, showing yes. hands, please. Thank you. So um, I entitled my uh, presentation "Travel and Interpreting: A Journey into the Multiple uh, Worlds or Words and Journeys of Interpreters." Hmm. And I'm going to share with you the structure. So this is the structure of my talk. I'm going to speak about word roots, the roots of things, persons, and basically words, because words like, like human beings, they have roots, they develop over time, and identity and experience. So identity and experience, basically related to the profile of an interpreter. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, specify uh, or devote a a, a, a sort of paragraph on identity and belonging. Then word roots, basically three or four words, and then interpreters are the new nomads or people on the move. Uh, then I will share a personal story. Uh, in a creative writing I have written, and I'm still writing, so I will have an, uh, uh, an extract from it two or three paragraphs, perhaps I will read. Then uh, I will investigate travel as an interpreting act the omnipresence of the interpreter, the image of the interpreter, how, is it, how the interpreter is being seen by different parties, and then thoughtful travel for interpreters and how it is uh, uh, helpful to, and how it is really a source of knowledge for interpreters. Then interpreting and the multiple journeys. There are multiple journeys in the, in, the, in the overall travel, linguistic and pragmatic journey or journeys, physical and logistical journeys, psychological and mental journeys, cultural journeys, and I'm not going to uh, spend much time in these journeys because you know them all, and I am lucky that I am speaking after uh, Professor House because she laid the foundation or the, the context, I would say, for cultural uh, journeys, but I will see it from a little bit different mm -hmm. uh, perspective, and then I will conclude. But uh, before that, I'm going to show uh, some pictures as part of uh, photography. Uh, photography is one of my hobbies and perhaps uh, I learned it from interpreting when I started translating some workshops on photography for professional photographers and how to take a professional picture. It's not a matter of luck but how to, uh, when a viewer s uh, sees a, a, a picture, can safely say that this is a professional picture not uh, by way of capturing it by luck, for example, sunset or sunrise. So on my travels, I, um, I started to practice this hobby 
and but these are uh, shots of interviews and encounters with people who are who have inspired me and have uh, uh, impacted my professional life personal life and and and, and so on uh, but i'm going just to uh, flash on them very quickly and then uh, in the presentation of the talk you will uh, understand why i am displaying them so first of all, this is the uh, Court of Justice, the oh, European Court of Justice. Impressive. Uh, and I would Lovely. like to invite you to see the, the booths over there, 28 booths. And because I'm going to share, you a story, share with you a story on, on, on that. This is, mm -hmm. These are the booths. Then uh, this is uh, at the uh, shores of the Congo River. Uh, so Cindy from the Congo Brazzaville and her children. This is Cindy. As you can see her, and this is uh, Sufi. Oh yes, now I see her. Yeah, but this is like oh. So this is, is this? a Sufi. Darvish. I have interviewed a Darvish. Yes, and yes. I'm going to share a story uh, from Turkey, from Istanbul, and I uh, I know that yeah. there is someone from Turkey following this, mm -hmm. and this one is in Ethiopia giving uh, a hand up to uh, uh, a woman, uh, a Bush woman. Then uh, a conversation, an encounter with a uh, a, a priest, uh, a Hindu priest, and then mm -hmm. uh, giving hand to some uh, w uh, ladies doing farming in Indonesia in uh, the island of Sulawesi. Mm -hmm. And then this is a room in the Peace Palace in The Hague that is home to the uh, uh, the International Court of Justice. Uh, and I was interpreting there, and there was a, an incident happened. So I'm going to share this story also with you. And this is the president of the European Court of Justice. And I have interviewed him also. Uh, and I'm going to share some audio uh, with you on uh, translation uh, terminology. So. Very good pictures. Mahmouda. Thank you. In particular, in Corona times where we are not allowed to travel, yes. this is, uh, this is very nice to see. So, that. and this is a ride on the mountains of Mongolia. Mm. And then, okay. So, uh, I'm going to go back and to stop sharing this. Uh, I think now it's stopped. Yes, it's stopped. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for your help. Thank you. We are all learning, Juliana. We are all learning. Thank you very much. Not only me being an elderly woman. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now that you have seen the structure of my talk, I'm going to address uh, the question of word roots, uh, the identity and experience of the interpreter. In an interpreted encounter, the interpreter is often belonging by birth and education to one of the many cultures in the room, in the conference room. He uh, promptly switches between the source and the target poles of communication and cultures in order to ensure, ensure mutual understanding despite individual cultural differences. I am Tunisian by birth and education. More particularly, I am from the central part of Tunisia and I started interpreting for my mother, whom I interviewed and, and recorded on several occasions. Uh, and by the way, I am always having fantastic encounters with her. I always take advantage of her presence when I am not away uh, to interview her. She is in turn, in those encounters, in interpreting to me uh, past stories and perhaps narratives, past narratives about local culture, identity and also national events, mostly related to the resistance movement. Uh, uh, or the, the Falaga movement, which is, an uh, these are the independence fighters against the French occupation, as experienced, of course, by uh, her forefathers and my forefathers. One of my future plans, by the way, to uh, uh, translate these narratives into English. She used to tell me that our forefathers used to lead nomad-like lives. 
there were seasonal nomads and that and she's always teasing me by the way uh, saying that I am the son of two journeys a summer journey to the land of uh, harvesting in Ifrigia in the northwest of Tunisia uh, which is a region uh, a, a, an, a cereal producing uh, a re region and a winter journey to date dates harvesting in Algerid uh, region in the southwest of Tunisia uh, and uh, you know when when you are hearing these narratives from 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 person as close as your mother uh, you will be fascinated more because this uh, is related to your to your identity by by the idea of travel and you get into the philosophy of, of travel discussing it even with yourself so in these two journeys a whole my mother kept on saying uh, a whole a whole heritage of stories poems and and songs have been created these two journeys form their travels travel in arabic is safar so let me now examine very briefly the etymological uh, or the etymology of the three words Safar in Arabic, journey in English, and translation in English. I found out that an etymological link between travel, knowledge, uh, experience, and translation is very strong. Uh, and first, Safar and its derivations, uh, as found in the uh, two dictionaries, uh, Al Qamus. Uh, al muhit wa lisan and lisan al arab dictionaries uh, first meaning safar al shay'u wadha wa kashafa means uh, things become clear clearer visible and obvious safar al subhu ay adha wa ashraqa ruwaidan ruwaidan means the dawn breaking gently Asifru is another derivation which means the book or the great book Al Kitab Al Kitab Al Kabir a uh, book of knowledge so, uh, or a masterpiece in the sense so uh, safara uh, travel is also the root for knowledge and for experience compiled in a book and uh, from Safar also we uh, find Asfar uh, and the plural of Sifr like Asfar Musa uh, which are the revelations to Moses the, the, the Torah which are five books I think and also Asifara embassy uh, uh, Sifara is from also Safar so embassy uh, comes from Middle French embassy means a mission of uh, a group of persons sent out to a foreign country to conduct negotiations and establish relations exactly like interpreters uh, interpreters have uh, often been portrayed as negotiators and, and mediators uh, so uh, a large number of translation scholars have remarked on the etymological link between translation and travel, exemplified by the Latin root trans, translatio, translatio, or a tradictio in French, which both imply movement, transportation, displacement, and travel, both on a physical and on a metaphorical uh, uh, level or journeys. Uh, experience now experience is one of the interesting words for both travelers and interpreters uh, because it is necess a necessary condition both travels and interpreters they need experience uh, Eric Lead in his book in uh, the mind of the traveler uh, published in 1991 page 5 examined the Indo-European root of experience uh, which is 
per p e r which is to travel uh, this route illustrates an intuitively uh, the the connection between experience and travel John Locke uh, identified in experience uh, the primary constituent of personal identity. He uh, pointed to the role of travel in the shaping of personhood. Uh, interpreters are also the new nomads. They are people on the move. And the relationship between travel and interpreting might be compressed as to the traveling interpreters, uh, as professionals moving from one hub to another or from one country to another or city. But the relationship involves a much more complex pattern of representations, interferences, images, readings, and even cultural and linguistic uh, journeys and, and transfers. And these points will be explained shortly uh, in, in, in the second part of this talk. So interpreting can uh, then be uh, seen as a complex practice involved in the uh, construction of images uh, and identities, whether these images and identities are individual or collective, and in the interaction between cultures. Uh, travel, in, in, in the sense, is not only a form of regular and normal movement, it can safely and genu genuinely be uh, presented as a form of interpreting. Travel as a form of interpreting. Here is a personal story, my personal story, on the interconnection and mutual interdependence between travel and interpreting. Despite the fact that it is uh, part of a creative piece of writing, uh, as I said earlier, and that it like this talk depicts a mix of both physical and metaphorical journeys and perhaps spiritual journeys Pers personal story uh, the beginning of the extract star gazing the journey to the stars my spiritual and translational journey started on the rooftop of our old rural house in the central part of tunisia during one bright summer night, a perfect night for stargazing. My mother, again the presence of my mother, or my identity. My mother had already spread out colorful blankets and pillows. Before the night sank over that small rural house and the blankets, the sun had already shone for those blankets and they avidly drank in its rays to offer me later in the night a spiritual banquet for a meditative or meditative silence or a romantic conversation with the stars, the moon, and perhaps with the flashing lights of high altitude aircraft or aircrafts going from Europe to sub-Saharan Africa or Australia, crossing that twinkling night sky. No camera or technology photography again. No camera or technology. And by the way, I, I see photography as an act of interpreting, taking a shot and, dis and displaying it or transferring it to another audience in a different setting is a form of interpreting. So no camera or technology was there to capture the moment or rather to translate the stars and the constellations except for one memory, two eyes and multiple dreams. One of my greatest dreams was to start a real life journey in which the physical world would be explored as a next step following the spiritual exploration of the astronomical world. Here again, there is uh, another world for the interpreter, which is the astronomical world. 
The second mission was even more difficult than the first, as ninety talks with and about the stars flowed freely and smoothly like a river flowing down from the mountains. And I'm going to tell you stories also about the mountains. No need to know another foreign language, or more precisely, no need to be an interpreter to translate far-flung worlds to a local and physical world. The language of dream was more than enough. The physical and spiritual journey. Born and raised in Tunisia and educated in Tunis and Manchester, my life journey, the road to meaning, and the map of translation have all led me travel the distance to the moon and back in my visits to more than 46 countries, as mentioned by Juliana early on, and to more than 400 cities and many more small towns and villages. Over the years, I started to find ways to translate my global passions to local needs and perhaps professional hobbies. Language is one of those hobbies. And this led me to the more cutting edge passion for photographic imaging, as well as meaning making by interpretation, a ta'wil, or meaning milking by inferencing a bilistidlali well Istanbul. So those passions dragged me. Those passions dragged me to another stream in the main journey, in which I started to think globally and interpret locally. Travel has taught me the reality of meaning and the true meaning of words and expressions, such as the word of homelessness. Having a short or poverty, having a short yet rich conversation with a proud and noble lady like Cindy and her children, seen earlier in the picture, uh, in the Congo Brazzaville at the shores of the Congo River, does more to comprehend and humanize the reality of poverty than reading a library of great books on the subject. This also inspired me to properly interpret emotions and uh, get the human being to other people and I don't like to say access but to read the human side in any speaker and uh, uh, transferring this to target audience and of the extract. So it is argued in this talk that travel can be an inspiring and can be uh, an inspiring uh, exercise and can be made as an interpreting act if it is exercised as thoughtful travel. So I'm trying to discuss uh, with you now the omnipresence of uh, interpreting agents and show how encounters, uh, even normal encounters, can also be encounters, uh, 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 inspiring encounters and also some other encounters as encounters of control and hegemony. So thoughtful travel as an interpreting act and the omnipresence of the interpreter. In principle, all travel, at least all travel into other countries and other cultures, all travel implies literally some form of interpreting. In most cases, this means that the traveler has to seek possible ways of communicating with local people. I am always seeking to engage and communicate, engage very closely with the locals and communicate with them who most of the time do not speak the same language, such as a bush woman uh, high in the mountains of Addis Abeba, seen in the picture, or worshippers 
in the in a Buddhist shrine high in the mountains of Mongolia, seen in the picture, or having a very nice and pleasant conversation with three female uh, farmers uh, on uh, the Indonesian uh, island of North uh, Sulawesi. So throughout the centuries, translators and interpreters have often been portrayed as explorers, discoverers, and even smugglers of riches across uh, borders. Interpreters always strive to meticulously and, f uh, and, 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 and uh, faithfully uh, transfer the reality, render the reality or the words they interpret. In, the, in, the, in this rendering uh, uh, of events, places, peoples and narratives, uh, the interpreting act takes place. So, uh, or the noble interpreting act. So the interpreter presence is always crucial for the traveler in need of translation whether in the form of a more experienced traveling campaigning or more often that of an educated local. Uh, a frequent uh, instance of uh, lost in translation or communication issue is for example when you are abroad and in a small town and not everyone speaks English uh, or the languages you know over there and you wish to have a strong coffee before a talk like this strong coffee uh, uh, in, in, before a talk you wish to give and the waiter does not understand r exactly what you like so what happens in this 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 case another client or the colleague of that waiter uh, will almost certainly step in to interpret your wish this is exactly what happened to me when i was in maribor uh, so many years ago when two twin sisters jumped in to make my point through uh, in slovene language so the image of the interpreter let's move now to another journey journey of the explorers and colonizers perhaps we move now to the dark side of the encounters the dark side of of, of the, the the work of uh, uh, interpreters local interpreters play the key role in exploration and colonization this is a reality so in western colonization western colonial powers either recruited westerners who had had extensive uh, contact with the locals uh, to act as interpreters however most of the time it is uh, it, or it was the locals who had been forced to act as interpreters by means of kidnapping or and or enforced acculturation and bilingualism or biculturalism so an example of that would be a very good example of that i think would be the example of les pères blancs in tunisia white fathers these were missionaries uh, sent to africa uh, the first missions to tunisia took place uh, in 1875 and later these white fathers included uh, some Arab missionaries from the Levant, the great Syria, uh, and, and the French colonial power shared with them the same Christian faith, uh, so uh, the, the French could use some of them as interpreters between the French soldiers on the one hand and the Tunisian locals on the, on the other. In these me mediated encounters, the local laymen had no direct contact with the, the foreign uh, with a foreign language with with the french uh, except through the prism and 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 and, and the tongues of the syrian uh, interpreters that's why uh, there are um, some narratives uh, explaining why tunisians are still calling the french language suri means syrian from syria uh, we say in tunisian arabic yahki suri uh, 
uh, means uh, speaking French. Uh, so um, the Syrian uh, was uh, mistakenly taken as a foreign language because sometimes the uh, Syrian interpreters when they would like to uh, share something with their uh, with, with the, f the French soldiers or with uh, the other Syrians they uh, started to speak in French and they thought that th this uh, the the Tunisian locals they thought that this is uh, this was their language then the word uh, Suri uh, started to uh, accommodate all other connotations related to modernity and modern lifestyle. Anything coming from France would be called Suri. So we say Libsa Suri or Libsa Arbi means a uh, way of clothing. In, uh, that is modern and that is traditional. Uh, even now we, ha we call the shirt the normal shirt Surya. It is coming from France, but it is called Surya for Syrian. Uh, um, so, but but uh, in general terms, perhaps this uh, does not apply to the White Fathers or Les Pères Blancs. The role of the locals, in particular, has been very questionable and subject to substantial doubt and suspicion. Uh, the interpreters are allied and yet potential enemies to both the colonizers and the colonized. That's why the interpreter's image has always been tainted with uh, much mistrust and suspicion by either or both foreigners and locals. Interpreters also sh uh, share so many common denominators with tour guides. They share so many things in common and I, I know personally a large number of uh, uh, tour guides who after the collapse of uh, the uh, tourism sector and tourism income due to terrorism in Tunisia and elsewhere they started a new career as conference interpreters so interpreters like tour guides can sometimes be accused of petty offenses uh, as in the many allegations of guides accused of conspiring with uh, greedy shop owners to persuade less experienced and uh, 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 experienced traveling uh, visitors or naive uh, visitors to pay uh, exaggerated prices the climate has impacted very positively in, in entire cultures and you are going to see how uh, this uh, impact has been uh, uh, portrayed and has taken shape. Uh, I will tell you a personal story to describe the life-altering effects of travel and uh, to explain how to have the kind of journey that will indeed change your life. And here I'm sending my message basic primarily to uh, students and nov novice interpreters because I know uh, that large number of interpreters some of them are present here and they can mention Professor Mansouri, uh, Sami, uh, uh, Mirvet and, and, and so on uh, live out of their suitcases. So throughout travel uh, people can gain experience and when travelers and interpreters can make it to the so-called thoughtful travel uh, they can gain a lot so thoughtful travel is well worth the time the fatigue the jet lag uh, th and, and even uh, th the loss of money in case of extended stays or missed flights just like travelers through their interpreting interpreters are cutting new paths in the wilderness and travel opens up to the wonders of the world it helps you appreciate nature and people for me it's a great day walking high in the mountains of Mongolia with a local interpreter a guide from the Ministry of Defense telling me the story and I still remember now that that story with, with the pictures I have and uh, you have seen one of them early on so telling me the story of the mountains and the supernatural forces 
of those mountains and uh, taking all the way to the uh, top Buddhist temple. Uh, travel and encounters like that and encounters with uh, an inspiring uh, Hindu priest can connect you uh, with the nature, with the culture and so on. On a business trip to Istanbul I attended a, a whirling dervish ceremony, dervish ceremony, photo uh, number two I think. One uh, uh, dervish kindly accepted to spend some time after the ceremony to have a conversation uh, on their fascinating Sufi order. He explained their ritual in the following manner, quote, when we start the meditative dance, we start our spiritual journey towards knowledge. We start having our arms crossed like that. A gesture representing the unity of God. We keep one foot on the left fixed uh, on the floor representing our presence in our physical world anchored in our societies and communities the right foot spins around and around embracing the beauty of God's creation in all over the world a very good and powerful message of tolerance I raise one hand up to acknowledge the love of God and the other the other hand goes down like the spout of a teapot as I spin around my hand above receives the love from our Creator and my hand below showers it onto all the his creation so this conversation inspired me to continue the search for the balance I wish to strike as a traveling interpreter between the global and the local, between the self and the other, uh, and between the source language culture and the target language culture. Traveling interpreters use their journeys to have enlightening linguistic and cultural experiences. Uh, to meet inspirational people and interpret the seemingly unusual perspectives to non-locals and interpreting one's own thoughts and views to locals and mediate between competing ideologies. And suddenly the palette with which we paint an interpreted event has more colors. The traveler must always interpret the acts and utterances of the locals in order to make sense of foreign places and foreign people and enjoy the games of different perspectives. It's a, a very nice game, an enjoyable game. And here I wish to share with you a funny story from Arabic literature about Juha. And I know that uh, Arab participants here know Juha quite well. Uh, a story about seeing things from uh, our own perspective. There is a character in the Arabic literature, as I said, uh, called Juha. Uh, he's a comical but a wise character. Uh, once he was on, 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 on the side of a river bank, a wide river bank, and they, I think the story took place in Iraq. A man came to the other bank, he was on a, on a, on a, on a travel. Uh, a man came to the other bank of the river and shouted over to him, how do I get across to the other side? And Juha replied, you are already across the other side. So we experience otherness when we come into contact with the unfamiliar. It is the feeling that things are different. And my favorite books are those written by Ibn Battuta in his journey. And Ibn Khaldun. And Ibn Khaldun has written Al Muqaddimah introduction uh, and uh, lay the foundation for a whole branch of knowledge that is uh, uh, sociology out of his observations in, in his journeys. In addition to knowledge that I could 
acquire from uh, documentaries describing far-flung places and even close places. Now, the difference between regular uh, or normal journeys and I would use the term interpreter journeys is not a matter of distance. Uh, I, I think the difference between regular journeys and interpreter journeys lies on how much otherness is present and how much uh, otherness the traveler uh, experiences and how much uh, interpreting has taken place from and into the traveler. Regular experiences uh, uh, or uh, regular journeys uh, involve just a little, whereas interpreter journeys involve a lot of that. So what's the difference between a trip to a local conference here in Gamart, which is a uh, tourist resort in Tunis, and a trip to places as far as Baco, Azerbaijan, Jakarta, Indonesia, or Addis Abeba, Africa, or The Hague, Europe. And why some interpreters find it more challenging to service a conference abroad with the same topic, with the same participants as one taking place in their own country. So this is a really a genuine question to ask. So let's move now uh, to interpreting and, and the multi, multiple journeys. Uh, first, linguistic and pragmatic journey. Uh, Cross-linguistic journeys that, that means the language combinations, the, the travel from one language to another, or from one structure to another, from one world to another. And uh, the, the greater the distance between cultures, the greater the interpreter's mediating effort both linguistic and cultural and I know that uh, Professor Mohammed Mansouri has addressed the subject on enter unrelatedness between languages the, the difficulties and the challenges uh, this also requires certain linguistic effort because languages display different patterns with respect to morphology and syntax and semantic equivalence even when they belong to the same family linguistic family there is always this effort uh, so different languages may be uh, may pose some challenge in the sense that uh, the the for interpreters of course uh, because the structure is important you have to start with something like in Arabic the structure of the sentence is as uh, is uh, VSO verb subject object while English and French for example and other Indo-European languages the structure is SVO subject verb object so the greater the asymmetry between languages the greater the language surface rearrangement and consequent cognitive load will be during the interpreter's performance there is also another journey which is a cross-field journey interpreters travel from one field to another uh, one day they might be translating or interpreting a conference on law and there are even subfields within law such as commercial law, the uh, family law, and, and so on, the, the terrorism, counter-terrorism law, and so on. And one other day will be tra tra interpreting a conference or a meeting in agriculture, fisheries, for example, or pastoralists. Uh, another day uh, or another conference, uh, they will be interpreting uh, banking staff uh, and so on and so forth. So these are also journeys. Uh, the other uh, item under this uh, journey, linguistic and pragmatic journey, is also synonymy. And synonymy, uh, there is another issue uh, here because uh, novice interpreters and translators, they take certain words as synonymous. Uh, and I really don't believe that there is uh, synonymy or at least full synonymy. Uh, 
in a conference the interpreter can come across uh, two seemingly uh, synonymous terms such as assistance and aid two simple and recurrent uh, 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 let's say phrases uh, like legal aid and mutual legal assistance mutual legal assistance or MLA um, in criminal matters for example is a process by which states uh, and central authorities in particular seek uh, for and provide assistance to other states in servicing uh, for uh, of judicial uh, document and gathering evidence uh, for use in criminal cases this is not the legal aid legal aid on the other hand is an aid uh, provided by an organization like the state or the Ministry of, of Justice uh, especially to serve the legal needs uh, of the poor uh, so these are two different uh, terms and it is really very important to make that distinction in the Arabic language uh, and I have noticed that most interpreters render both uh, phrases as al musaada musaada here and musaada there in the same conference that might be confusing al musaada al qanuniya al mutabadala and al musaada al qanuniya i would rather suggest musaada for assistance and uh, ma'una for aid legal aid is ma'una and ma'una is al-awn uh, more for the poor it goes with, 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 with the idea of the poor and the needy in addition to so many other uh, uh, phrases and terms uh, that might look uh, similar but they are not like task force working group uh, we can suggest different terms in, in Arabic as well uh, words do travel also how do words travel polysemy and complementary polysemy in particular is a structure uh, to show how do words travel they start with core meanings in Arabic core meaning uh, that is present in all the occurrences of that uh, word uh, or phrase they, they, uh, and, and the, the core meaning travels with, with, with that word with that word in all of its occurrences uh, so uh, it is very important for the interpreter or the translator to be a linguist also and to take that journey and to follow uh, that that journey the journey of the uh, of the word i will give you one example uh, because you need to understand the context to to get to have access to the intended meaning of the speaker and each speaker has his own intentions his own way of using words so uh, th that's why it is not random uh, but we need to uh, understand and to have access to that and to knowing that knowing the speaker will make your task much easier uh, the example uh, I can I can take one example from Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, he uh, would like to take one example from a speech he has uh, given in a conference uh, which took place in Marrakesh, 2019, uh, on the Migration Compact, uh, which is an agreement between states. He said, "Quote." but there are or there have been many falsehoods about the agreement and the overall issue of migration so let me begin by dispelling a few myths myth myth number one here i would like to highlight myth the compact will allow the united nations to impose migration policies on member states infringing on their sovereignty false and he said false this is the other term i would like to comment on myth and false so myth in arabic would be translated literally in the core meaning as uh, ostura or uh, something uh, not real uh, but i think we can go the extra mile and have access 
to the intended meaning and by reading the context reading the speaker i think he is also in this same statement the discourse of of uh, mr guterish is also putting the blame on some states for disseminating that narrative so myth here i would not translate it as uh, i would not translate it as ostura but rather as moralata and false would not be ghalat or khata because there is also a, the element or the meaning of uh, holding states and perhaps other parties accountable for that it is iftira al iftira um, in addition to some other terms like qada for example uh, it displays so many meanings uh, and i have carried out a study on the adjective good and they have found that uh, it displays 27 27 equivalents in arabic uh, good bec uh, because uh, depending on the uh, noun it uh, pre-modifies uh, qada for example uh, is to predestine or to decree uh, when when i say for example qada allahu azza wa jal uh, or qada bil adli uh, to judge uh, in this context qada al gharada to accomplish a task qada al ahda means to carry out or implement qada uh, hajatahu to urinate uh, simply and, and so on and so forth so uh, do uh, words do travel as uh, as as i said and and we have to understand that within the context this is experience now with knowledge the, the knowledge is like the core meaning but also you need to travel with the word where it goes you have to have a very clear idea about what might be meant in that particular context uh, I'll give you an example. I've uh, served some uh, training courses for the law enforcement agencies here in Tunisia, basically on crowd management. And there is a term used in, in, in this uh, uh, context, interpreted event, which is missiles or missiles depending on the pronunciation, British or American. And missiles in that context is, is not the rockets but rather anything that can be thrown onto the, uh, the, the 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 police officers and the shields so missiles here it's not qadaif means rockets like one interpreter has said once but rather al-maqdhufat anything that can be thrown like uh, pieces of stone or uh, bottles and and so on. there is another term which is intifada uh, I remember I was servicing a, a conference in uh, uh, for the Sudanese, Sudanese opposition before the toppling of uh, uh, President Omar al-Bashir, and uh, the uh, participants there were using the term intifada, and intifada uh, it is an Arabic word that found its way into English. Uh, which means an armed uprising basically of Palestinians against Israeli occupation uh, of the West Bank and Gaza Strip uh, the Sudanese were using uh, Antifada and the interpreters were rendering it into uh, either Antifada or into uprising uprising is uh, for the English speakers, especially the Americans, is something armed. So the element of violence is there. But it does not necessarily include the element of violence as it is uttered. But here you need to work to tailor the, the, uh, the, the meaning to match the intended meaning for the target audience. And one of the clients, who is an English speaker, approached the interpreters during the coffee break and told them, please don't use the word intifada or uprising anymore. And she has expressed the concern of the donor parties uh, that uh, they 
might be accused of funding an armed uprising or funding violence so here the interpreters uh, changed uh, later the term and translated it something like peaceful uprise protest uh, or protest like that for intifada uh, terminology is another uh, another issue and uh, uh, makes interpreters uh, take different journeys uh, depending on who is speaking and to whom he is speaking um, I can give you one example a very simple example like inmate uh, or inmates if it is uttered by the uh, prison administration it would be al mudaun here in Tunisia means people sent to correctional facilities so the, the sending uda deposit it's literally this is the meaning uh, uh, but for human rights activists these are prisoners war prisoners or uh, or political prisoners so these are prisoners uh, even the the word prison uh, 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 can be uh, used the, the same concept can be expressed in a way to match the uh, speaker or the audience if it is uttered uh, by a, a prison authority between inverted commas it would be correctional facilities and rehabilitation centers uh, but if it is uttered by a victim uh, who has been submitted uh, or subjected to human rights violations it will be prison and nothing but prison um, in addition to the uh, uh, sequence or the system of uh, uh, justice and courts and how a person uh, starts to be a suspect then accused then convicted and so on um, other examples like response team uh, we uh, uh, in Tunisia tadakhul means it's not intervention teams uh, or team but response um, or engaging the target for example when when you say engaging the target it means to kill the target by a law enforcement agent so they use the term to engage the target and you have to understand that uh, engaging means just to kill um, or uh, uh, you you need to understand also the system of positions uh, in shoot uh, shooting positions for example standing uh, uh, kneeling and uh, uh, prone uh, uh, position and so on and so forth and also you need to take into account the uh, context uh, when choosing one term over another for example the in, in a gun like m4 gun uh, there is the front side and the rear side the front side for example in 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 arabic is al mahdaf al amami and then al mahdaf al khalfi these are very awkward words to be used now nowadays especially for tunisian law enforcement agencies because yeah, they are used to uh, and familiar with uh, differ different terms with different terms so the the interpreter has to do some search and some investigation over the terms and the jargon that is being used by that institution or that agency and i always try my best to have a, a fruitful conversation with the with the agency to which i am interpreting to get the uh, proper and the most appropriate terms uh, we say in in in, 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 in Arabic so this is the communicative pur purpose means to use the same language uh, and the language or the jargon that is being used to uh, make the communication uh, successful so uh, in addition to the pragmatic journey pragmatic journey or from a pragmatic point of view communication between primary participants uh, 
speakers and addresses because after all this uh, uh, the, the event or the meeting is made for them and then secondary participants the interpreters uh, so the relationship is not direct between the primary participants and the secondary participants here the interpreter is the uh, is at the same time the receiver and the sender of the message but not the author or the addressee except on rare occasions uh, when the speaker wants to draw attention to the interpreter's performance or wants to comment on the interpreter's performance uh, like uh, uh, I can here share with, with you that very famous example by uh, Muammar, leader Muammar al-Gaddafi when he uh, gave a, uh, a talk at the UN and he uh, stopped, uh, had the phone and he said, I wonder how the interpreter would translate this when he used a, 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 an Arabic saying. Uh, and he said, oh, Mr. Interpreter, we uh, do not translate it this way. It is translated as uh, add insult to injury. So between speakers and audience, uh, uh, speakers and audience on the one hand and an interpreter on the other, there is a considerable physical distance during simultaneous interpreting when interpreters are working from the booth. So the communication situation is most of the time shared when uh, uh, the, the interpreter is working from the booth, but not necessarily the physical space. An interpreter is confined in these in these in his booth or her booth uh, in the back of the hall or in another room even uh, sometimes in another country in the case of uh, video conferences so in these cases the, the the interpreter follows the proceedings via a monitor uh, and it is very uh, delicate uh, for the interpreter because he's not present in in in, in the, that space and i uh, uh, know that one of the speakers has addressed the uh, remote simultaneous interpreting platforms uh, tony leich and uh, uh, and we discussed there the uh, advantages and the disadvantages of working remotely or uh, working using blind booth. So an audience uh, is made of specialists, laymen and non-native uh, speakers. Uh, they, so the needs are different and if you are not there it will become very hard for you to guess which word you should use uh, so because of the different language requirements now I'm going to uh, investigate the shared context and translator versus interpreter uh, interpreting a like translation is an activity that implies a shared communicative situation between speakers, addresses, and interpreters. And uh, here you can see that uh, I'll tell you an example of uh, a conference in which one of the interpreters, the Arabic booth, was calling, uh, was uh, referring to one speaker as him because the voice is a, a man-like voice while uh, the speaker was a woman uh, a woman so it is very important for the speaker to be there and to discover to do a sort of exploration in the hall uh, to know who are the speakers and the names uh, and so on like uh, the example of uh, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Sharpiston uh, the uh, one of the advocates uh, general of the uh, court, uh, the European Court of Justice. So the shared uh, uh, context is also helpful for the interpreters to know how to translate certain words, uh, like uh, titles. And uh, uh, a title is used to address or refer to a high-ranking official, such as an ambassador or a governor. Uh, and Arabic is really rich in modes of uh, address and honorary titles, titles differ greatly across the social, religious and political hierarchies. 
I would like to uh, give the example of excellencies in one of the uh, speeches uh, given again by uh, uh, Antonio Guterres. He said excellencies and the interpreter knows that in the room there are heads of states no monarchs, no uh, princes, uh, but uh, uh, presidents, um, prime ministers and ambassadors, basically. So I think if the interpreter has some space, the uh, speaker is not going fast, he can unpack that term, translating is it as Ashab al-Fakhama, wal Ma'ali, wa Sa'ada, and so on and so forth. Uh, there is another example uh, in a conference held uh, in the Peace Palace uh, in The Hague, uh, which houses the International uh, Court of Justice, the ICJ. Uh, one session of that conference took place uh, in the Japanese room, uh, which owes its name uh, to the uh, suburb silk tapestry on the walls. Uh, and, and those ta uh, tapestries were given uh, by the uh, uh, Japanese government to the Peace Palace as a gift. Uh, uh, and, and that tapestry is full of flowers and birds. Uh, so the chair of that session uh, made uh, allusion to that in his introductory speech uh, in which he started to describe the birds, the tapestry and so on uh, to come to the conclusion uh, that judicial systems like tapestry are making societies more coherent. So here uh, the interpreter had the advantage of being there, seeing what the speaker is describing to be more faithful to the meaning. Again, uh, there is another journey, which is the journey of idiomaticity and intertextuality. Sometimes you refer, uh, you, you, you quote from other texts, uh, uh, even though the uh, original discourse is not that idiomatic. Uh, just one very simple example, a speaker uh, starting, uh, for example, a new uh, uh, item on the agenda about fundraising saying for example that you know and we move on now to money and you know that uh, uh, how fundra fun fundraising is crucial to our activities I think here you can go the extra mile a little bit uh, saying that ننتقل الآن للخوض في مسألة المال والمال قوام الأعمال I think المال قوام الأعمال is idiomatic expression in Arabic and uh, I think if, if, if the speaker were uh, an uh, uh, Arabic speaking person would be using that so uh, I think there is no problem of going also translating uh, some stuff with idiomatic expressions or for example and we move on now uh, to the field of or the subfield of uh, we can translate it uh, um, uh, into and so there is also a physical and logistical journey uh, the map of the world has to be very present uh, in the head of the interpreter or at least the map of the country in which uh, or from which the participants come or uh, they are discussing about uh, just one example I've been uh, I served one conference on Syria Syria crisis and uh, uh, there was a question of uh, deployment of uh, troops and so on into a place called Al Jazeera and uh, the interpreter made a very serious mistake by translating Al Jazeera into the island in English but Al Jazeera is, is a region in the north uh, northeast of Syria and it is not a coastal it is not an island so there is a, that is a serious mistake uh, another example from Sudan uh, the, there are uh, two areas that are called always the two areas 
they they are very recurrent in the speeches so you have to have an idea about what are these two areas these are um, south cordovan and blue nile uh, areas uh, there are also some technical challenges in the uh, sound system the uh, interpreting system and the interpreter has also to move on to uh, do that journey also to avoid challenges and technical issues because simultaneous interpreting requires the use of microphones headsets uh, booths uh, and so on in case for example of whispering without without technical uh, technical devices and technical uh, facilities uh, the interpreter's voice would cover uh, the speaker uh, so the interpreter's voice covers that of the speaker uh, due to ambient noise in the room like ventilation uh, and this is really very bad for for the vocal cords and uh, it is also very hard uh, to interpret when there is difficulty uh, hearing the speaker i'm going to go fast now with the psychological and mental uh, journeys uh, psychological we have to have passion for the job for interpreting we need to go uh, to overcome fear and to manage the mental effort as uh, uh, explained by uh, Kilian Sieber and Daniel Gill uh, how to deal with rap rapid delivery and foreign accents and we have discussed this in other previous talks how to split the attention uh, and uh, Daniel Gill has uh, uh, discussed this uh, extensively in his talk uh, how to manage stress uh, so many interpreters have discussed this also time constraints and uh, uh, the uh, uh, limited amount of information especially in sensitive and confidential meetings uh, we have also discussed this uh, uh, there is also a journey in the mind of the interpreter uh, the input how to comprehend how to uh, conduct active uh, listening and how to make the transfer or the conversion to have recourse to the uh, memory uh, and then also to produce a fluent and coherent output in the target language so all of this system is really uh, very important for the interpreter and there is a journey it's the journey of meaning uh, exactly like a machine coming uh, in the form of an, uh, an input uh, comprehend and then processing and then output um, also the uh, exploration the exploration is takes place in three phases the exploration in the preparation before uh, the pre-event uh, are the uh, pre-event phase uh, doing the exploration of the institution the participants and so on and so forth and also uh, during the event uh, exploration uh, at uh, the event by knowing exactly in and making use of that shared context who is there uh, who is going to speak uh, to get uh, used to the accents and also exploration when uh, interpreting in in on mic in a way in that uh, those very few seconds 10 seconds you do the exploration like a pathfinder uh, uh, guessing what uh, he might be saying the uh, the the, uh, the speaker so in that uh, i would call it the decalage time the decalage means the time lag between the speaker and the the interpreter there is also so another journey that is cultural the cultural journey and I'm going to skip this uh, and I'm really very lucky that I'm speaking after uh, professor house who uh, has uh, uh, discussed this extensively uh, there are uh, challenges uh, the interpreters are facing with humor sarcasm and jokes because these are culture uh, specific uh, interpreting is an intercultural communication par excellence the communicative situation in Involving the interpreter is always and by necessity an instance of intercultural communication. Uh, Kundo et al. 1997. Any, so any interpreted event is an instance of intercultural communication uh, th the example of access to justice for example uh, access to justice uh, the 
English speakers uh, and, and the culture they would uh, they, they, they favor uh, terms like access but in Arabic this is really it is sometimes it is pejorative to use nafed uh, uh, which is uh, the uh, uh, literal equivalent of access uh, access to justice and nafed ila al I would say al ihtikam ila al qada uh, better الاحتكام إلى سبل العدالة أو آلية العدالة not only القضاء uh, justice or courts but also alternative mechanisms such, uh, such as mediation or arbitration uh, culture bound terms and expressions these are hampering sometimes communication there are many different ways to categorize culture bound uh, items or terms and I think the categorization uh, put forward by Peter Newmark is still sound um, uh, who uh, made a cat categorization based on uh, ecology first material culture artifacts uh, and then social culture uh, organization customs activities procedures concepts and gestures and habits for example uh, it is very important for the interpreter to know the culture of the source language uh, and the culture of the target language I, I remember I was interpreting an event uh, and uh, the Dutch organizer wanted to uh, uh, to have an idea about the preferences of the uh, Arab participants and one of them said uh, I like fish for example and the uh, in the Dutch uh, a speaker said you will be f uh, we will have a surprise for you here uh, because there is herring so uh, here herring if the interpreter is not familiar with herring that is the tiny fish that is smoked uh, and uh, uh, then it will be very difficult to 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 translate uh, that uh, there are other examples uh, here like cultural also culturally speaking uh, one example is culture abduction and uh, the in two legal uh, in two different legal cultures it is really problematic and i remember that uh, many uh, interpreters uh, translated child abduction as اختطاف uh, الاطفال child abduction by their own parents so uh, abduction for the arabs uh, it can be translated as al ikhtitaf and ikhtitaf in Arabic has uh, is a criminal offense and cannot be an act uh, done or carried out by the parents uh, that's why uh, I suggested the term intiza'ah uh, means to take the child away from the other parent uh, also other examples uh, that are really culture specific such as uh, custody and most interpreters they translate it as al-hadana uh, while custody in Arabic is uh, either hadana or wilaya hadana is the custody um, uh, the, the custody that is or granted to the mother and al wilaya is the custody that is granted to the father uh, in addition to the very problematic term of uh, kafala and whether kafala is adoption in the english uh, tradition or the english legal uh, practice uh, and here i can display a uh, recording of an interview with uh, uh, the uh, president of the European Court and this uh, question of kafala whether it is adoption is a case brought before the court from the Supreme Court of uh, the UK uh, there was a case of uh, two spouses of uh, French nationality uh, resident in the United Kingdom applied to the United Kingdom authorities uh, for entry clearance as an adopted uh, child uh, for an Algerian uh, child placed in the uh, in their guardianship recueil uh, legal in Algeria under the kafala system following the refusal of the United Kingdom authorities to grant clearance a decision which was appealed by the child the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom has asked the Court of Justice in essence whether under directive 2004 38 EC the child can be classed as a direct descendant of the individuals in 
whose guardianship she was placed under kafala this would facilitate her family reunification in the member state britain where those individuals are resident in conclusion one can safely argue that thoughtful travel does not carry and reinforce the interpreting and mediation competencies and skills but also often is an interpreting act in its own right second interpreting is an attractive profession for people of curious and independent cast of mind third like a traveler the interpreter in his exercise takes multiple journeys through strange and intricate worlds four traveling interpreters come to appreciate and comprehend novel arguments ideas new ways of thinking unusual accents that less traveling interpreters may never accommodate or consider five but we can only reap those rewards of travel if we are open to them and if we reach the land of dates and cereal harvesting so let's take the summer and winter journeys and get beyond our comfort zone and need to choose to be challenged and start recording ourselves recording our creative interpreting products and songs regular travel might have restrictions like in the circumstances of covid 19 but interpreting journeys will continue forever without any restrictions thank you very much for your attention and i'm really sorry for my lengthy talk i yeah. fell in the rabbit hole as i've told you over to you <laughs> professor thank Hans. you very thank you very much Hamuda. this was an absolutely lovely not definitely not too long but very poetic very insightful um, and may i say also very charming lecture right can i can i start asking th or making three comments before i turn over to the audience is this possible yes i can hear you thank you please go ahead yes i i just i just wanted to make a few remarks before we can turn over to the audience and um, and, and question can i do this yes. please as, go ahead as a, sort of, as a sort of discussion first of all all, I want to say that not only interpreters do travel thoughtfully and very aware and very to tolerantly, but also people like myself, a translation scholar. I have traveled around the world and I can also subscribe to everything you say. I've been to Kazakhstan, I've been to South Africa, I've been to Peru, I've been to etc. etc. And, and actually, also, if you work as a as a translation scholar, you can also do this. Second comment, in German, the German term for uh, translation is Übersetzung, which means it's very nice. You Übersetzung, you, uh, what you do with, with, a, with a boat from one shore to another shore, right? And the German term for experience is Erfahrung, and Fahren means to travel, to wow. drive. So that's yes, also that, that, would, that would help you in your uh, argumentation. Yes. I have another comment that uh, struck me when you talked about that the interpreter tends to be distrusted from both sides, um, from the locals, etc. I, I, I grew up, I was born in Berlin in 1942, so you see how old I am. My father was a wonderful man, just like you talked about your mother. He spoke Russian fluently and also English because he's been to the United States. He taught himself Russian. After the Second World War, he in, in Berlin, he acted as interpreter for the Russians and for the Americans. And I still remember I was a small child. There were always the jeeps by, by these uh, occupying uh, nations. And he kept us alive via interpreting. So it was a very, very useful uh, uh, profession in that it, otherwise we would have probably uh, starved. Um, and also more to our, t somebody in the, in the audience commented that the interpreter gets killed 
often in, 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 in times of war. For instance, in Iraq, in I thought there is in the German news that there was a, a heavy German conting, contingent in Afghanistan. And I read that the, the uh, Afghan um, Pashtu or Farsi speaking interpreters, they were shot later when the Germans disappeared and went home. They left the interpreters alone, which is a, which actually many people said was a crime by, by the German troops. And my last little uh, point is you mentioned that the, uh, the, the shared communicative situation in interpreting. Yes. This is, of course, different in translation. We also have a shared communicative situation, but it is a mental, it's a mental yes. cognitive one only, which is different from the real communicative sharedness in interpreting. Okay, so yes. far, once again, thank you very much for your, uh, I really very much enjoyed your lecture and I hope we will meet in person sometime when we can travel again. Hopefully. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. I think these are comments, but I totally agree with you on everything. I just, uh, while you were talking, I put down my thoughts and I thought I, I must say. So how do we helpful. continue? Now, people who are, want to say so something. So I, I can see them. I don't know whether you can see the participants and there is a blue hand. Can you see it? Uh, Professor Mohammed Mansouri first. Professor yes. Mohammed Mansouri, then. It's, it's, can I say something, Hamouda? Why yes, don't you guide the discussion? Because yeah, yeah, I, I, uh, do yes. it, please. Please, okay. thank you, yeah, with pleasure. Yes, Professor better. Mohammed Mansouri, please, yes. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor House. Thank you, Dr. Salfi, for your enlightening talks. Uh, Professor House spoke about the uh, need to strengthen linguistic and cultural competence among translators. Yes. And Dr. Salfi spoke about translators as nomads. I'd like to see uh, this nomadism accessible to our students. When I was a student, I had the opportunity to spend a whole year in England. Our system was like that. You choose to do English, you go and spend a whole year in an English-speaking country. Mm -hmm. Now, our students are denied this. So how can they access that culture? How can they know more about it? How can they encompass in their training all those concepts that were introduced? So this, this, this is really a problem with regard to the training of our translators or all those who do uh, a different language, let's say English or even French. Why not those who do French go and spend a, a year in France and then, you know, uh, uh, learn a lot about this. So if you see any competence in, in, in Tunisians with regard to English or with regard to French, then this is due probably among the older generation to that opportunity to be able to spend some year in contact mm -hmm. with, with, with that culture. Yeah. But before leaving both of you with this question, I'd like to, if I may, uh, share with you a bit on the main virtue of introducing that analogy of a medical doctor that you, Professor House, introduced. A medical doctor is a reader of signs. They, they, they look at the signs and they read. And they introduce all those aspects that you, you have introduced. They take into consideration the fact that there's a humanistic aspect, that there's a, a, a cognitive aspect, that they take into consideration anthropology, that they take into consideration the fact that you have a, a main group and then you have subgroups in the culture. So probably this could be one way of introducing our translation and interpretation students to learning more about what is required of professionalism. So I'd love really to hear uh, some of your thoughts on, on these aspects. And I'd like to thank you again for, for, for a rare opportunity that is offered to us. Uh, Professor um, uh, House, uh, many of my students are using your models. 
uh, for evaluation of, 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 of uh, translation and things like that. And they are referring to your, to your books. And I have also introduced them to your presentation of last week so that they can really learn a lot from it and introduce as much as they can in, in, in their work. Thank you again very much, both of you. Yes. Thank Lovely. you. Over to you, Professor with, House. With, Yes, I would, when I mentioned this, the, the, these few um, remarks about uh, the, the professionalism of the translator, what I really wanted to say is that actually that basically upgrading the profession from, as you know, the, the status and the recognition of uh, uh, interpreters and translators is not on a par with highly esteemed professionals, like doctors, like lawyers, etc., even engineers. People think, aha, it's just somebody who, you know, knows the language and he does something like that. And I think we should change that. Basically, uh, in order to be able to translate well and to interpret, and interpreting, I recognize, is more difficult because it has to be done under enormous time pressure. But in order to be able to do this task, uh, professional, it, it's a very difficult, and uh, translators need to be educated, highly educated. And, 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 I mean, the, 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 you, your suggestion of uh, traveling to a foreign country and staying there for a year is well and good, but you can also do this online nowadays. I mentioned to Hamuda, I mentioned my daughter studied and learned Arabic. She's now married to a, a man from Tunisia. I mentioned this um, before. She learned Tunisian Arabic and she learned Arabic over the internet. And she's constantly uh, uh, doing to, to, to get better, etc. You can do a lot also just by reading. You can read. I mean, I'm a, you have to be a voracious reader. Voracious. You have to read all, read all the time. This is very, very important. You don't have to, do, to go, go to expensive courses. You can do this on your own if you're really in love with the subject and with the, with the profession. That's what I would say. It's good. I mean, not everybody can travel to foreign countries, but you can do a lot by, by reading and self-educating yourself. It's possible. And people do this far too little. Sorry, I'm, I'm preaching now. Thank you very much, Professor House. Thank you, Professor Mansouri, uh, for uh, your very kind visit. Uh, I cannot add much to what Professor House has already said. Uh, and here, it's a problem of opportunities. And opportunities, unfortunately, have become individualized. So each one has to open windows for uh, or room for opportunities uh, to travel abroad. And I think this is not only the problem of novice uh, translators and interpreters to be exposed to the, to the foreign culture or the f foreign language, but also a problem for experienced translators and interpreters. And you know, Professor Muhammad, that so many interpreters, they don't have a Schengen visa. And it is really very problematic yeah. to fly them to uh, uh, an event taking place in, 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 in a European country. So I think there are some challenges and restrictions. And this is towards the end of my presentation, I, I, I made reference to that. Uh, but I think exactly like Professor House has said, I think the uh, internet now is providing tremendous opportunities. Uh, but yes. again, I am a true believer of face-to-face -face contact and, 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 uh, mm -hmm. uh, and nomadism, I would say. Uh, because yes, we absolutely. cannot go to the harvesting online. We cannot uh, do the harvesting online. So we have to be there on the spot. So with that, uh, thank you very much again. Uh, I would, with your permission, you. Professor House, can we take uh, rounds of uh, um, questions, three sure. or four each time, yeah. for the interest of yeah, time, yeah. because I can see so many hands shown. Yes, do. Yes, thank you. So uh, let's have... Uh, uh, Sorry, excuse me, just one. Yeah. Uh, Wisal, and then uh, Sami, then uh, Khidiri, then Muhammad Zaroud as a first round. And then second round, Muhammad, uh, and then Dina Qabani, then Salwa Al Batut, then Salwa Al Batut. Yes, please, first round, Wisal, Sami, Khidiri, and Muhammad. 
محمد زغود هاي ثانك يو سو ماتش دكتور صالحي اند ثانك يو سو ماتش دكتور هاوس attention to when it comes to terminology for instance they don't for example they don't uh, distinguish uh, the difference between al uh, wal uh, or uh, and so uh, they say what they think delivers uh, the meaning uh, and that can be catastrophic or disastrous sometimes uh, so how to deal with that especially when the novice interpreter is not sure Uh, whether or not that term is right to use uh, and you know the conversation is still going and uh, they run out of time so what do they do when they're not sure about it thank and, you very uh, much my, my please. I have a please. question if you don't mind yeah yeah go ahead please uh, okay so the world of freelancing is sometimes hostile to contract what do you have to say about this thank, thank you. you very much thank you I didn't understand the second question, sorry. So it said the world of freelancing is hostile uh, to interpreters or something like that. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Excellent, thank you, Wissal. Uh, Sami. Marhaba. Ahlan wa sahlan. Good evening to everyone, Madam yes. House. Thank you very yes. much for your presentation. <laughs> uh, Dr. Uh, Salahi, thank you very much uh, for the journey you took us through uh, uh, in a journey through landscape and... Uh, time, what is needed to be a good uh, traveler, a good interpreter. It is uh, a pity that the word interpreter does not include uh, a, a suffix like trans, which uh, translates movement. Uh, it is uh, a pity that interpreter includes something that it is introspective rather than uh, the, the contrary knowing that interpretation doesn't need introspection. It needs exactly the, the contrary. Thank you as well for having started by telling us the story with your mom. Uh, we all say that uh, good interpreters are interpreters who translate into their mother tongue. So I guess there is also a link between the story with mm. your mother and the fact that we are always talking first in uh, classifying languages as mother tongues and secondary uh, tongues. You also spoke about the question of trusting uh, interpreters in um, in Latin. A translator, let's say, is called uh, traduttor, traduttore, which is uh, said sometimes to be also traditore, someone who, uh, mm-hmm. who does not uh, remain faithful, who, uh, who is a traitor to the message. <clears throat> And there is a very interesting uh, word in French that is uh, truchement, truchement which, com- <clears throat> Pardon. which comes from the word torjoman, uh, but, but it means just the intermediary, Uh, ceci a été fait par le truchement d'un monsieur, d'un intermédiaire, d'un, d'un, d'un interprète. So, it, it is very interesting to see that our job as interpreters has found a place in French dictionaries with a meaning that always um, re- recalls the, um, the translatory process. Uh, you said that an interpreter is a traveler. That's true. I feel as an interpreter, as a citizen uh, of the world, not only uh, a Belgian citizen or a Moroccan uh, citizen. Um, the question of mistrust is very interesting because uh, in the far past, um, when we read how interpreters were used in the Ottoman Empire, uh, interpreters are also used as ambassadors. That's really interesting. There is a very, very close link between the, the two jobs. The job of uh, being a uh, Botschafter uh, in German and uh, someone who carries the message. A Botschafter, mm-hmm. Botschafter in, 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 in Dutch, means someone who carries a message. And interpreters carry a message. 
And German and, and Dutch languages, they have this in, in the word ambassador, ein Botschafter. Uh, and interpreters also carry messages. Uh, there is a, an English expression that says, don't kill the messenger. Mm -hmm. It's also valid for interpreters. Don't kill the interpreter. Don't kill the translator. I'm only yeah, a messenger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've been quite um, surprised when you spoke, uh, Hamouda, about the um, tour guides uh, becoming overnight interpreters. Can you please tell us more about this experience? Mm -hmm. Because I'm buzzed when I hear such uh, things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I know you, you understand what I mean. Uh, you also said that interpreters are considered usually as secondary participants. I do not think so. <laughs> when I deal with clients, I always try to educate clients so that they understand that interpretation and interpreters are not to be considered as secondary participants. They are the primary participants because, because without interpreters, there will be no event. So maybe we should... Um, we should um, think twice about the role of the Torjuman, the intermediary. Is it only a secondary role or is it the principal role? Uh, I liked also uh, the examples that, um, that, that you led um, regarding some mistranslations or the fact that in, uh, in the combination between English and Arabic, uh, sometimes we need two words and, or three in order to translate a single uh, word. Indeed, for, for, for the example, you, you said excellencies. As an interpreter, I always uh, translated into Arabic by Ashab al-Fakhara, al-Ma'ali, wa Sa'ada. But when I'm in Jordan, I add a fourth one, Ashab al-Utufa. al -Utufa. You know that. <laughs> I know, of course. What does For it mean? It judges. means that, yeah. Judges, not only judges, ministers are called. Oh, really? Utufa. I know yeah, it's yeah, judges. Ministers, yeah. They don't use Ma'ali, they, they yeah. use al -Utufa. So it means that an interpreter needs to know geography, as you said, and needs to know history. And an interpreter needs to know his audience uh, as well. Um, just one, uh, so I, I, I actually put two questions regarding the tour guide, regarding the, the role of the, the interpreter, or his position in an event, principal or secondary. And just one little observation uh, regarding uh, what Dr. Um, Mansouri said. In Europe, we have, a, we have a program called Erasmus Mundi. Yes. I'm not a promoter of that program. But... Uh, I do not believe that uh, such uh, programs are only uh, open or possible to European citizens. On the contrary, there is Erasmus, which is uh, open and accessible to European universities and, st and students. And Erasmus uh, Mundo is, uh, or Mundi, I don't remember, uh, is open to, uh, to, uh, to students from the Mediterranean and from uh, the Balkan uh, area, I think even from some farther countries. So there are still possibilities to, uh, to, to, to have mm -hmm. uh, uh, exchange between, uh, between students and universities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. S Sammy, are, are you done? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sami. Uh, let's move on to uh, Khdiri Narges. Um, yes, thank you very much, doctors, for this uh, amazing uh, opportunity given given, uh, given us. Um, I have a little question to me, uh, Professor uh, House. I was wondering if we can apply the mode of uh, uh, text analysis on... Um, on um, oral texts like uh, audiovisual uh, script, just like a written text. Thank you very much. This was my question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Muhammad? Uh, hello, everyone. Hi, Did I'm Dr. Zaroud. Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sahi, for this um, inspiring talk. Um, it really inspires uh, like our students to become um, interpreters like yourself. And thank you, Professor House, for your uh, talk about um, 
culture. Uh, I myself um, recently used your um, quality uh, translation quality assessment model in one of my uh, recent um, papers, and I hope uh, hopefully it will uh, be published very soon. Uh, and uh, my my question to my questions or like um, two comments to Dr. Salhi. Uh, first of all, um, thank you very much for the journey you took us from like um, this scratch to your personal experience, moving to like um, some hints or like instructions uh, to interpreters. Uh, I like all of these and. Um, uh, as I understood from your uh, talk, that um, you are a researcher, interpreter, uh, translation teacher, translator, and creative writer as well. So, uh, <laughs> well, uh, my, question, well, my question here is, because um, I do like um, four of these um, tasks. Uh, I do interpreting, I do translation, I teach uh, translation, and I um, uh, conduct research in translation and interpreting studies. So uh, my question here, where do you find yourself? Do you find yourself uh, <laughs> as an interpreter, translator, creative writer, or where do you find yourself exactly? I can tell you right away from now. <laughs> I, am, I am jack of all trades, master of none. Okay. No, you are not. He's too I'm modest. Right. Come on. <laughs> Don't be yes. fishing for compliments, Hamuda. <laughs> <laughs> I do agree with the Professor House. You are master of all. <laughs> yes. uh, well, uh, my, my second question uh, is, um, as I've understood that um, you are interpreting like English, Arabic, uh, Arabic, English, uh, French, Arabic, French, English, or three languages. So uh, if we are taking directionality into consideration, where do you think um, you find yourself uh, like much more uh, comfortable? Uh, whether you are, uh, when you are interpreting from English into Arabic or Arabic into English or French or uh, what languages you interpret from. Uh, then uh, my, my third comment is on... Um, the term that you mentioned, and um, uh, Sami has just commented, uh, which is uh, excellency. In the Gulf area, they add another term when they interpret this into Arabic. They interpret this into like Ashab al Fakhama, wal Maali, wal Saada, wal Sumu. In addition to. Wal Jalala. Yeah, wal Jalala, yes, exactly. Yes, uh, so these are my comments, and thank you very much. Um, thank you very we, much. We really enjoyed your talk. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, Professor House, we have permission again because I can see two or three hands have disappeared. So only one hand left. Salwa Batut, can we take her? Yes, sure. Yes, please. Okay. Yes, Salwa, please. Uh, first of all, I thank you for uh, this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Do you hear me? Yes, very well. Oh, and we okay. can see you with your, your red <laughs> headset as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, do you think that the performance of the interpreter who has a cultural background of the source and the target language, je, je parle ici des deux langues, is always better than the performance of that interpreter? who has not this background. Uh, here I call uh, this background a journey in the cultures. What do you think about that? Clear, thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, perhaps Professor House, if you'd like to react on some of the questions asked. Yes, I, 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 the, the, the first person was, I think, Rissal or somebody. Yeah. I yeah. can't say much about the terminology. That was the question about the terminology and how difficult it is, right, Rissal? That's what you said. I can, I can only say that there must be very good data banks with many languages that you can nowadays access over the internet. And there you can do research on the, on, 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 the, on, the, on the various terms. About freelancing, obviously, I can't say much. Uh, how it is difficult to freelance, I mean, Hamuda can probably answer that. Shall we take turns with the individual speakers, Hamuda? Oh, yeah, yeah, of you course. you say something now? Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, thank you. With, 
Wisami. Wisami, yes. Uh, for Wisali, yes, um, I think novels interpreters are, are they have to to commit mistakes in the beginning. So the, the, this is the the, the objective uh, means they will learn by experience. That's why I have uh, emphasized on the role of experience. Uh, and experience is not a, a, a uh, an accomplishment or something that we can get overnight. It requires time, training, and experiment. So uh, what I would like to recommend is to uh, to engage in uh, an, a life of experiments and experiences in the sense that you do not only wait for real life conferences but rather you can create your own conference home by receiving a, hoots, uh, a headset like the internet YouTube and rec you record your output and then you comment on that and little by little you will uh, you will you will know what is the uh, difference between uh, galat and khata uh, or uh, 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 any other term like iftira uh, uh, so uh, and also you will get rid little by little you will get rid of the fear because the fear is hampering the uh, sometimes the communication and uh, the interpreter from performing well uh, with regard to freelancing and uh, the freelancing world as hostile to the interpreters, yes, there is a big difference between freelance interpreters and staff members, especially when it comes to trust. And here I wanted to link this to the question asked by Sami. Uh, freelance, uh, staff members are more trusted because they know the speakers in the organization and they, most of them they uh, are given the text beforehand early in advance but freelance interpreters not especially when uh, the, the meeting is sensitive uh, it is hostile uh, also for during the first steps that's why i uh, recommend that you have recourse to recommendations and sponsoring by senior interpreters and more experienced interpreters so you have to travel through the winds of uh, the wings sorry not the winds the wings of an experienced <laughs> interpreter yeah. and, and the winds also <laughs> yes so these are my responses to Wissal's uh, questions over to you uh, okay. Professor yes. House let's continue with the very insightful uh, uh, remarks and comments and questions by Sami uh, you were in the previous meeting as well, I remember you. And first of all, the, the, you made a remark about or commented about the interpreter uh, as, a, as a traitor. Or he, he or she is always seen as a traitor. That is quite true. And again, I can give you the, the example of my father after the Second World War in Berlin in 1945. I remember my mother, I was too small then, uh, it told us later how the neighbors were suspicious of us because my father did this interpreting job for the Russians uh, and, 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 and the Americans that were there in Berlin after the war. As you know, there were four, four parts, parties, the, the French, the, the Russians, the Americans, and the British, and my father did this. And they, they really looked at, at us as, as traitors because of my father's job. And um, for mentioning which actually is somebody who carries a, a, a message, the interpreter as well. But I have to basically contradict you in, in, uh, when you talk about the primary role of the interpreter. You very nicely said there wouldn't be any message or anything <laughs> if, if, if it were not for the interpreter. But on the other hand, I mean, I have written this is, I say, in, <laughs> in my books. It is always a secondary task because something is there and then the translator or the inter does something. So I would definitely say <laughs> secondary, but secondary is not bad. It's um, maybe we can use a different term, a facilitating role, we could say. Mm. Would you be with that? No, I, I, I agree with you. I totally, yes. Of course, so how can were, I not agree sort of, with you? You were slightly House. jocular. But no, let, no. let me yeah. also talk about what you mentioned, Erasmus. And Erasmus, in my, in my active time as a university professor in Hamburg, we of course had many Erasmus uh, people, Erasmus in, in the European sense. And I have to say, um, that may disappoint you, it never properly worked. 
it was always one-sided. For instance, um, the, um, the, it, it was always the, fr the, the Germans who went to France, for instance, and the French had no intermingling with family thing, which I thought was not the idea. And secondly, the Erasmus students, when they came for only, let's say, three months, they never learned the language they were supposed to, to learn. They, they met with other people and they spoke English and they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Personally, and this may, may sound very cynical, it was a complete waste of money, right? So that was, that's my a, a personal uh, non-scientific non opinion. There is another, another program within the European Union which is called the uh, University of the UFM, the United... Uh, the, the Union for the Mediterranean, which has two seats, one in Slovenia yeah. and one in the, in the city of work? Fes. Does it work? Yeah, yeah, it, it is quite good. I think that uh, it is a good occasion to spread that kind of uh, information and knowledge. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. I think that Erasmus Mundo works a bit better than the real Erasmus. The, the other one didn't. It, seriously, many yeah, people say Yeah, I, I agree with you. It was a holiday yeah. program. It's, it's lovely. It was <laughs> Non in, in Hamuda's term, it was <laughs> travel paid by somebody else, but you know, the opportunity wasn't really used. In yeah. many, not in all cases, obviously. I'm, ge I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing a little bit, but yeah. and it depends, of course, uh, on, the, <laughs> on the, the individual. Uh, on the individual. So there is that program, and there is the other one, which is the University of the UFM, which is very interesting. So maybe uh, your students, uh, Professor Hamuda, Professor Mansouri would be interested in, in checking those, uh, those places. And if you need any, any, any guidance, I, I, I'm at your disposal. Mm -hmm. Thank you okay. very much, Sammy, for the offer. Uh, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Sammy. Thank you. Uh, I'm aware of time, uh, but uh, uh, Professor House, you are the master, and uh, you uh, manage the time you way the way you uh, you, you you like, and uh, of course, uh, yes. And we actually, should in, in about twenty minutes, because it's twenty to ten, in yeah. about twenty minutes, it's my bedtime. I yes. So let's stop in, in, in and I in get up at. Five or six? Never. I'm joking. It's ridiculous. Yes. Obviously, 15 minutes and then uh, we finish. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so very quickly, I would like to uh, get to, to respond to uh, Sammy's questions. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, interpreter uh, or in, uh, the, the route it does not uh, include the element of travel, yes, but it is uh, uh, more. Uh, includes the ta'wil. Ta'wil is a fully fledged discipline. Uh, or ta'wil al hadith in Arabic. And it is a miracle that is given to prophets, Yusuf, that will hadith. So uh, 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 um, uh, when Yusuf or Joseph was informing them about the food of that day, so taking certain events that are taking place outside the scene, that particular scene, which it was a prison scene at the time. So uh, that wheel is uh, really uh, more noble than even to travel, but it is the knowledge of something taking place elsewhere. Uh, mother tongue, yes, um, and mistrust. Traditori, traditori, the translator is a traitor. Traduir say trahir or turjuman in Khawan, and don't kill the interpreter. I totally agree with you. But the, the question about tour guides, uh, yes, most of them, they have very. Uh, uh, at least the, 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 the names in, in my mind now, they uh, have a very um, advanced education uh, degree. Mm, they are very well educated and they have served the encounters with tourists and so on, knowing the places and they are uh, perfectly bilingual or trilingual most of the time. And then they, they stepped in. And with experience of over two years, I think, uh, this is the feedback of uh, some, not only me, but some colleague interpreters. And they really appreciate their performance. And I know there are some uh, interpreters here from Tunisia, and they know, they know them. So, but I, I agree with you, and I know why you are asking this question. But I totally agree with you on the uh, training and, uh, and, 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 and the like. Uh, with the, 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 the interpreters, are the, the climate of mistrust again and killing the interpreters, I would like to uh, state another or to share another information. Here in Tunisia, after the toppling of the former regime, uh, 
Some uh, officials um, uh, uh, implicated with the former regime have been included in a book that was called the Black Book. And uh, I know at least four or five interpreters and translators were included in that Black Book as, uh, because they were translating for the former regime. So I think this is not a sin or a betrayal. Uh, but this is really uh, a very good question to be raised, or in Iraq, mo uh, so many interpreters are being killed in conflict zones in Iraq and Afghanistan and so on. Yeah. Uh, uh, secondary participants, the status, I mean in the communication. And I, uh, on the contrary, I'm a proponent of the idea of the interpreter going the extra mile with the client and assuming some other roles, sometimes like advisors if, yeah. uh, and a host. Uh, if you have a, a, a bridge guy who is in Tunisia and doesn't know how to have a proper haircut uh, or to, uh, uh, to know uh, the equivalent uh, medicine here in Tunisia, so I think you can go the extra mile and, 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 and help. Uh, so this is a status all also uh, provide some uh, uh, cultural uh, consultation in the sense that you say well this is not proper here to say it culturally speaking and here I uh, I'm aware of time but I'm going to share with you a short story uh, there was uh, in a crowd management uh, 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 workshop uh, there was a training a drill with uh, officers uh, acting or uh, playing the role of uh, the uh, writers uh, uh, and other officers playing uh, the role of uh, police officers and uh, there were two bridge guys and trainers uh, one with uh, with a mop and one with uh, with the police officers and they were encouraged the the, the mob to uh, tease and provoke the police officers who were with their shields with rubber cops and everything uh, and to throw some uh, missiles or missiles like in english uh, english pronunciation or american pronunciation means to throw anything uh, like bottles or uh, 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 um, stones and so on and one of the bridge trainers found a piece of bread on a small wall so he took it and he has thrown it onto the shields and the exercise stopped at that time and he didn't understand why what, what happened he says Hamuda, tell me what happened and here the interpreter has to act as a mediator a cultural mediator explaining what happened this is not proper to throw that piece of bread that is put over there for birds to eat, and this is a blessing, and it is really offensive if you throw it onto like that. So I think, and so many other examples, I, I, I have written them, and I have recorded this, by the way, from the, the, the speaker himself. Uh, yes, uh, with regard uh, to yeah, the role of participant, of course, he has to go the extra mile, but in that communication, because the conference is not being held for the sake of the interpreter. It's for the speakers sharing knowledge with the audience. So it is in the communication, but the status, of course, I'm a proponent of a much greater role to be uh, given to the interpreter. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, next, please, uh, Professor House. Uh, yeah, can you tell me about the secondary role again that Sami uh, uh, attacked? I think with all with all the, what Hamuda just said, it's, it, it would be say something like a facilitating role, making something happen and helping people to understand uh, the differences. Uh, I think facilitating is actually uh, it, it's much better than secondary because secondary carries it has a con connotation of being yes has, has a slightly sort of belittling connotation. I, I agree i agree i agree, I agree. anyway the next question was by if i pronounce it correctly is kadri kadri yes Kedri? yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and 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 uh, actually my model can be and has been applied to audiovisual and to uh, interpreting uh, uh, events also. It has, for instance, also been applied to the cover of books. There's a wonderful uh, uh, book, Recovered Rose, or, or whatever the title is, 
and it's just uh, applied to, to titles and covers with pictures on it, etc. So it's perfectly possible to do this with a bit of um, adaptation, obviously, right? So that, that was your question, and I've answered Thank it. You. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah, Thank you're you. very welcome. And the next one was, I think, Mohammed, right? Yeah, Mohammed Zahoud. And I, it, it was directed at you, I think. It was mainly think, in yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I will answer it very quickly. So, uh, thank you very much for the nice words, uh, Dr. Zahoud. About the status, uh, yeah, I have already answered the, the question on, on status, where I find myself. Uh, I think I'm doing everything. Uh, so, here, and everything is serving the other. And I am really uh, um, happy with that uh, meeting point, uh, to be placed in that meeting point between the, th uh, the three backgrounds uh, because when I'm teaching I can bring to the students very empirical uh, uh, knowledge and uh, experiences and stories from, 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 from the market and when I'm doing interpreting I am relying on the research I'm conducting uh, the things that have been investigated by other researchers and so on and so forth with regard to uh, the directionality uh, I am more comfortable with Arabic into English uh, sorry uh, English into Arabic so this is my main direction but of course oh. when you interpret especially abroad you have to do the retour into English so I am basically more comfortable English Arabic and secondly Arabic into English and then from French into Arabic and then French to, into English but occasionally I cannot do simultaneous interpreting into French the French booth I don't do it except in consecutive I can do into French uh, with excellencies, yes, because this is also knowing your audience. In in, in that uh, the meeting I mentioned earlier, there were no uh, princes or uh, uh, monarchs uh, present uh, there. And uh, but Tut, of course, I I agree with you. Uh, having a bilingual and bicultural background is an asset to the uh, an advantage to the interpreter. And I am not lucky. Uh, perhaps uh, I am. Uh, I'm from Tunisia. I have only one. Uh, um, let's say uh, uh, cultural background by birth and by education uh, and I am really fascinated by the interpreters who have bilingual like Sammy here I can see uh, bicultural or bilingual uh, uh, background and I know uh, a colleague of mine who is really when I ask her where are you from she cannot answer the question she is from Canada born there uh, her mother is American. She got married yes. to a uh, French, and she lived most of her mm. time in South France and mm. some part in in Africa. And then now, uh, no, sorry, not uh, American, British, British American, British uh, Canadian, lived most of her time in France. And then now she is based in Switzerland, in Geneva. So it is really problematic. Sometimes one gets confused. Although she is British and Canadian uh, and, uh, from uh, the English part, Canada, but she is more comfortable and I like her interpreting into French more than uh, mm -hmm. yeah. this is experience again and the being exposed to the language. She, she lost some of her uh, mm -hmm. mother tongue, which is yes. English. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And I think I answered all of the questions. Uh, Professor House, would you like to... Yeah, I just wanted to add to the to, to the advantage of the of the, the bilingual or the bicultural. I just wanted to uh, <laughs> um, you know add some comforting remarks for all those poor people who do not have this bilingual or bicultural. You can always offset it just by what I said before by reading and acquiring knowledge. It's not, there's so much to be done on the internet nowadays. And uh, I can only again mention my wonderful daughter, whom I love very much, and how she manages to speak Tunisian Arabic uh, perfectly. And, and she learned it, first of all, not before she married and has a family here, in, in, or I mean not here, in Tunisia. She learned it over the internet. It's possible. If you put a if you have the motivation and you want to do it, you can always offset the disadvantage of not being bilingual and bicultural, right? Yeah. It's, it's absolutely perfect. Or again, my, from my own family, my father taught him to himself during the Second World War when he was sort of out of a job, whatever. And he was very good. 
He went up, there were no media at the time, in 1940, whatever. But it's possible if you do hard work and if you, this is for the students, do everything. It's very, very important. But obviously, it's, a, it's, it's an asset to have two uh, cultural or bilingual beds. But you can offset it if you don't have it. That's sure. what I want to say. Thank okay. you. Let me ask you a question, a Professor House, of a journalistic nature. Yes. Do you know some words in Tunisian Arabic? Do you know some words um, in Tunisian no. Arabic? Can you give us examples if you know? Um, but what, what, uh, I, I knew something about the, uh, at the end of Ramadan, what did you say? It's a trap, it's a trap. <laughs> what? No, it's not a trap, is it? No. <laughs> No, I, so I, 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 we say Aishik, or for uh, the Eid Mabruk, Eid Mabruk? Eid Mabruk, yes, I, I knew this because I had to say it, Eid yeah. Mabruk. Eid yes. Mabruk, yes. <laughs> okay, so I should charge you for this uh, inter inter interpreting service, Professor House. <laughs> okay, let's take very quickly Muhammad Salah Isa. then Mirvit Saber, then uh, Malek Shaib, and if we have some time, Sami again. Uh, and then uh, Reem uh, Hassan, uh, can you please go quickly for the interest of time? Yes, please. Yes, we have still five minutes left almost. Right. Anyway, who's the first one? Mohammed Salah. Uh, it's me, I guess. Greetings, uh, professors. Uh, oh, there's, 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 so the sound there is, is horrible. The background yeah, noise, I think. I hope it's now better. Yeah. Yes. No. Oh, okay. Uh, so you talked about your travel and journeys to the world of language and culture, whether it is physical or spiritual. And with that in view, how do you assess your journey through the depths of the virtual world with the pandemic going on and remote interpreting? Does it really qualify to physical traveling? I mean, here we are having this fantastic discussion, meeting professionals, <laughs> others, almost from all over the world, that otherwise wouldn't be possible without the cutting edge technology, cutting the distance between us. And thank you. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Uh, so, uh, now, Mervit, please. Where, where is she? Oh, M M Mer our co-host. Co-host, yes. Yes. <laughs> Mervit, are you there? Malik Shabe, and then we'll go back to Mervit. Malik, Malik, yeah, sorry. Malik, yeah. Malik, please. Uh, so basically, I just wanted to thank you both for the talk and to ask where can we find the presentations, the recordings for these presentations, because I had to miss the one from last week. Thank you. And that's it. Thank you both. Bye. Thank you, Malik. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Mervit, yes, please. <laughs> Hi everyone. Hi. Thank Hi. you, Professor. Thank you, Dr. Hamouda. And uh, here I will uh, just introduce myself as the Sufi as dancer. Let me show you this. I hope everyone will be able. To mm. Lucky you! I tried it. I, I tried. Perfect. I, I'm doing it too. <laughs> Mm, very actually good. i got uh, uh yeah i was trained <laughs> as a, so and also traveler yes and an interpreter mm -hmm. <laughs> i just wanted to thank you so much i really Absolutely. enjoyed it yeah. thank you so thank much thank you very much thank you very much <laughs> what a lovely session we had it is. lots of talent here yeah reem hassan yeah. please <laughs> Doc, hi. dr reem hi uh, uh, thank hi. you very much for this uh, journey i really enjoyed it um, I just wanted to share something with you is, um, as you know, I am a researcher as well, but uh, I was not a translate interpreter. So I became an interpreter with uh, refugees uh, who came from Syria and Iraq. And my role became actually a facilitator because most of the refugees I work with, they don't speak very well Arabic, they don't speak very well English. And with time, mm -hmm. I developed uh, different methods and strategies to make them understand both languages which are missing and when you are talking about traveling and uh, the journey from one country to another I was thinking about them how they have to live this bicultural life how they have to build a new life between their uh, first culture and then a new culture and mm -hmm. I think 
Now I'm thinking of them, maybe in the future they'll be perfect translators and be perfect uh, interpreters because they have this knowledge of uh, both countries. Yeah. But also now when we speak about translation and interpretation, I, I notice that we always speak in the context of conferences, but there are uh, also interpreters and translators needed in social settings uh, where people actually are suffering where people need um, more yes. understanding, more experience in life, not just linguistic skills, but also in humanitarian skills. So that's also interpreters should think about it. Very good. Thank, Thank you very good. much. Very good comment. Uh, let's good take comment. Dina Qabbani, please. Thank you. Thank you very much both for this wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. I'm sorry I'm listening to last week once, but I just want to talk, I just want to comment on one thing. That you've said that the interpreter could be an... an I think a, um, the interpreter shouldn't be an advisor because um, he should be, or she should be, or both of them should be um, uh, the channel only um, to interpret, not to give any advice. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 we're thinking. Oh, yeah. right, okay. <laughs> you yes. can't hear me think, I, I guess. Or yeah. thinking. No, thinking, yes. <laughs> okay. uh, so are, are you Pardon? done, uh, Dina? Pardon? Okay. You no, know, it's just my comment. Is I, When yeah, yeah. you know the culture, that will enrich your interpreting and translation. That will give a very good quality. Um, the, interpreting will be, um, um, the interpreting will be very good if you know the, both cultures. But I don't think that and the interpreter should give an advice because you'll put yourself into <laughs> deep trouble if you give the wrong advice. That's what I think. Okay. Thank you. Good. Got it. Uh, okay, Ola Tahir, finally. Ola, quickly, please. Yes, uh, this is Ola Tahir from Egypt. Uh, thank you for your own timing. Do you hear me well? Yeah, yeah. Yes, very well. Yes, I would ask a question. I, I didn't know if it is relevant or not. Do you think, guys, that um, an interpreter could lose some kind of his identity or, or find that he's following people, talking people's... Uh, talks and doing their own uh, way of thinking. Does this uh, profession affect the character of interpreter being uh, not this, uh, not isolated, but the, the way of thinking could be demolished okay. or something? Mm. Yeah. Interesting question. Interesting. Yes. Thank you. So, Sammy, finally, please, quickly. Yes, please, very quickly. Thank you very much. I yes. liked very much yes, the last quickly. question because, yeah. <laughs> interpretation is not a sickness first of all so it doesn't <laughs> interfere with your temper i just would like to go back to what you said the uh, hamuda said the staff interpreters are more trusted i must disagree with you because in our settings in the european uh, union and also in the united mm -hmm. nations when you're a client in a meeting room there is no distinction whatsoever between uh, the staff interpreter and the freelance interpreter the uh, the uh, the freelance interpreter in the booth so nobody knows uh, not to mention the fact that the question of, of trust uh, is, uh, is something that we have uh, managed thanks to AIC, our international um, association for conference interpreters. We have a code of conduct. So uh, if you are a member, you should apply with the, uh, those provisions. So uh, mm -hmm. Staff interpreter, freelance interpreter, there is no distinction whatsoever in terms of, uh, of, uh, of trust. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Professor uh, House, can you uh, give your yeah, account I of uh, actually, the questions? Yeah. Um, I'm starting with, uh, with Reem, because before yeah. that, I don't think we... Yeah. And I, I want to compliment you again. I thought it was a very, very well taken uh, a, a comment and suggestion is absolutely necessary and uh, uh, nowadays I mean as you know it, re refugees are in, in Germany we, we are the country in the European Union that has taken most uh, refugees Germany took in 1.5 million which is a lot by far and by yeah. population it's, uh, actually even, even more than, than Sweden and there is a great great demand for um, interpreters, um, and particularly with uh, languages like, uh, like Arabic and, 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 and other, other languages as well. So, 
Saharan and African languages, etc. The same uh, applies to, of course, doctors and other, uh, other um, people working in other uh, professions for the refugees. So thank you very much for bringing this into this uh, talk. And uh, I also want to comment on to, uh, to Dina, uh, uh, saying the interpreter should be neutral because he gets into hot water or she gets into hot water if, uh, if, if they don't. I mean, I think it's up to the discretion of the individual how far you go in taking sides or, you know, overstepping your, your inter-role, but being whatever. And again, uh, to um, the, the, a very interesting comment to Ola Taha, whether you can lose your identity by this constant inter whatever very interesting i think this is the the danger is is uh, there's much more of a, a danger for losing identity with mm -hmm. somebody who works as a as a spy i mean spies <laughs> lose their identities <laughs> I'm, I'm a great i'm a great reader of spy novels and, mm -hmm. and somehow maybe, maybe you can uh, hamuda you can compare the interpreter with a spy. And spies often lose their identity because they don't know where they stand. But interpreters, I don't think so. Okay, so much for me, Amuda, over to you. Thank you very much, Professor House. I will be very quick in responding to <coughs> the three or four questions asked. Uh, Mohammed Salah, the virtual world and the journey therein. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, I am uh, always uh, describing the, uh, the, the the internet as a horse taking us very far. Uh, mm -hmm. But I am uh, using those journeys with more caution. I'm cautious uh, because I've read a book that uh, made a turning point in my life, uh, written by the former director uh, directors general of Google. Uh, uh, entitled The New Digital Age mm -hmm. and the uh, warfare, the digital warfare and uh, and and, and uh, so I'm not really trusting it as face-to-face -face, uh, uh, meetings and physical journeys. Uh, yes. This is one thing. But I am using the advantages of the vir virtual world and the digital world. There is another question about the recordings. Yes. Uh, the recordings will be available very soon on a channel called Turjuman, and I will share it on my Facebook page. Uh, the time, uh, uh, the, the, the videos and the audios are uploaded. Uh, mm -hmm. Reem Hassan, I totally agree with you, yes. Uh, yeah. I put an emphasis on conference and simultaneous interpreting or booth interpreting more, but this applies also to community interpreters and interpreting in social settings. And I myself, I served so many uh, events uh, uh, for the, uh, the refugees in Greece. Uh, and I interviewed even uh, some uh, refugees about their journeys, treacherous journeys. Uh, and I, ha I have a talk online on YouTube on that and how the interpreter is a human being, after all. And for the uh, people in distress, they are, he is the savior. Uh, uh, now, with uh, uh, regard to the uh, comment put forward by Dina Kapene, I agree with you to some extent. Dina, uh, it depends also on the setting and, and, and the mode of interpreting. If it is simultaneous, I agree with you. But if it is community interpreting, you cannot do without putting some something from yourself you are a human being if you are seeing somebody uh, sinking or uh, injured uh, you will act as a human being not a, as an interpreter or you ha you can if you are for example uh, interpreting a uh, a medical uh, meeting for example in a refugee camp and uh, the uh, person the refugee who is sick needs to have a prescription very uh, quickly. So here you have to remove the hat of the interpreter or the so-called professional, and I'm not an advisor, to act as a human being. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Now, so it depends on the setting, of course, and the mode of interpreting. Uh, Ula, uh, the identity loss, yes. I agree with you because um, I would like to say that I'm still novice uh, and I'm still learning. 
And one of the uh, learning points I am focusing on now is on my identity, my status as an interpreter. That's why I always rush to, uh, to, to have an encounter with my mother for my identity, to have my identity, long-standing identity, confirmed and valued. And more than that, identity, as I mentioned in my talk, is not only the core and the beginning of uh, uh, the, 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 the self, but also it can be acquired and colored by experience. So, but it is also a matter of how much balance you can strike between what you learn and what you see, you can accommodate, but then also what you are and your roots. And here I don't lie, um, you can quote the Mahatma Gandhi who has a very famous say saying on that and this applies to interpreters as well. So with that, I think we have uh, covered all of the questions. Uh, and haven't time we? to say goodbye. Yes. So over to you, uh, Professor House, for uh, anyway, one minute to say... Anyway, thank you very much for, for, for this fantastic and very, uh, very, uh, how shall I put it, very touching um, conference. It was very, very good, thanks to you, Hamuda, with your uh, personal uh, experience and your wisdom. Thank you very much, and thank all the participants for asking questions, for being there and looking so beautiful over the screen here. <laughs> all of us, even Sami. <laughs> even Sami. <laughs> though, though today so he is, he, he's setting his own a modest, modest uh, appearance. I am in my, I'm in, in, in my living room. Is it, everyone uh, yeah. knows my living room right now. I'm in my kitchen here, as you can <laughs> see. Look at the blackboard. <laughs> Uh, Professor okay, House, thank you very much. Would you allow me? Would you allow me yeah. to ask a final question? Yes, is this the last Zoom meeting we have? <laughs> Hamuda organizes this. He yeah, exactly, I, because we don't know. <laughs> yes, this is the last for the first round. All <laughs> right, there will be a second round, and uh, we have two uh, speakers confirmed. All right. Who are uh, Professor Christian Nord, and by the way, uh, she, we postponed her talk because she uh, lost her husband, and I informed mm -hmm. Professor House. And uh, I phoned her up, and I found my condolences. I know her very well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And right. the second speaker is uh, the great uh, Noam Chomsky. He confirmed. But he confirmed. Excellent. Yes. No. No. He confirmed. Right. Oh, this is the second. Woo! The second <laughs> round, and uh, not forget the invitation. Yeah. Of of course, of course, and uh, but for the first round, this is the last of the uh, encounters on the shores of translation. So, let me play the troublemaker, invite everyone to unmute their microphones and do a very loud round of applause. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And good Thank night. you all, night. ladies Thank and gentlemen, much. dear friends, very, very students, uh, uh, colleagues. Malish Hamuda, Anjik Tarahm and Fadla, Abdam and Gadir and Gorfa. Yarit, you call Fibad and Mohammed. Sorry, I speak in, uh, English, yes. I, in Arabic, yes, in English. If you please, we need uh, some presentations in French and in Arabic also, not only in English. Uh -huh. <laughs> <It's> in <Arabic. laughs> the suggestion trying, is I really very trying. relevant, <laughs> and I have taken note of uh, your suggestion. Thank you I very much. Bilingual. <laughs> okay, thank you so okay, much. Thank okay, you bye, much. Bye. Bye, bye, bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. But again, thank last you. note, thank Professor you. House. Thank you. Uh, yeah, what? Uh, uh, the uh, inspirational uh, setting or mood is contagious, and uh, I do believe I do believe in the encounters, and uh, people cannot do well in a setting that does not encourage them to do that. So it is thanks to you uh, okay. all uh, uh, that uh, you made really uh, very active uh, uh, participation and contribution to these encounters. I would like to thank you all very much for what you have done. Thank you and bye-bye. And bye -bye. I never forget your Indonesian Shashi. Thank you. 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 Thank you.